Well, thank you very much for including me in this session about methodology. At, by being at the end, I have the advantage of seeing how many of uh, the things I would have talked about were covered eloquently by everybody else. And I've made adjustments, which, so the, the major theme of my uh, talk will be after saying just a few words about the elements of targeted sphingolipid analyses, just as I go through the sorts of things that we've done and, and some things within the methods that we worked with and the observations along the way that might be useful for folks to know. Even some of the, those, maybe many of them have been covered by other people, but reiteration of them I don't think would hurt. And then the end with what I found was a, a fairly early on in this work was a surprising punchline. There again are quite a few other places that you can look for uh, expansion of the uh, topics that I will cover. Uh, so Al, could you, could you push slideshow start presentation? Where is, no, that I'm missing. That's, that's right up there. Keep going over. Mine, or maybe it's, it's there. Could okay, be that. Yeah, there we go. There right. we go. Thanks. I, I apologize for that. So see, I did, I did qualify for the old age category. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, in addition to the uh, webinars that uh, I have been involved in, which could be useful. Of course, there's a whole set. Uh, some of them are spectacular videos that the chair of this session uh, has prepared and is on the website. And going back to then what the goal is, as you've seen in different iterations, there are a, lot, a spectrum of tools are available in lipidomics, uh, everything from very simple methodologies to tissue imaging methodologies. And in that complex group, our main technologies have woven their way through the use of uh, a special set of extraction methodologies optimized to give a, quant a rigorous quantitation across the spectrum of sphingolipids that we've analyzed, which has involved multiple extraction protocols and internal standards. Then uh, primarily lipid liquid chromatography, but I'll mention that there are some times where thin layer chromatography is handy. Electrospray ionization is the major ionization source, and then uh, different types of mass analyzers, but primarily a triple quadrupole and uh, quadrupole ion trap, and then data analysis by a variety of ways, which I'm not going to elaborate on uh, here. Starting off at the process, we had found it uh, helpful to uh, have as the first thing that we gave attention to was the actual protocol for the experiment. And if we were doing this as a collaboration, to have early interaction with the people that we were collaborating with. We prepared a protocol sheet that had an important component of it, that the protocol had to be approved before we would agree to do the analyses and that that should even happen before the experiments were conducted. Because in many cases, we would find that there would be some element of the experimental plan that could be tweaked in some manner to give better data and it was helpful to do that up front rather than after you've gone through a tremendous amount of work uh, in doing the extractions and the lipidomic analysis itself. And any of you who are earlier perhaps in your career and may be timid about making those sorts of demands, uh, let me assure you that I think everybody has in, uh, typically been happy about it in the end because it results in a better and more uh, rigorously publishable data set. Inside that protocol, were things like wanting to know right up front where there are potential biohazards because one gets spectrums of samples from human disease through um, uh, uh, dangerous uh, viruses or what that sometimes you're asked to analyze. So it's a good idea to have up front that and depending on your institution, make sure that you've cleared it through all the appropriate uh, agencies and perhaps requiring even a material transfer agreement. But into the more scientific side, the again, to know exactly what the objective of the analysis is helps you make choices in targeted lipidomic analysis about what analytes are the ones that you want to focus your attention on. And then after you have an idea about that, then to make sure that the methodologies that you will be using and that they will be using will be compatible. And again, it's often helpful to find out from the investigators 
exactly how are they homogenizing their samples. I heard, saw a question earlier about analysis of heart, for example, and a heart is a tissue that has a lot of tough muscle in it. And if one is dealing with that, then you often have to think about how you're going to be able to um, fully disperse the sample before you start the extraction. In the lipid maps work that was done with NASH, the cirrhotic liver was a lot harder to handle and to feel that you had confidently uh, gotten a, a good homogenate. So thinking about that as a valuable early step. Also to think about, is there any step in the procedure that may introduce an agent that will interfere with the analysis? There's a fair amount of work now being done with pegs. Uh, people sometimes use plastic pipettes that, uh, with organic solvents that you don't know that they're going to do it. Uh, for example, as they dissolve a lipid in something that they add to cell culture. Um, so to think ahead for that is helpful. Then, of course, you've heard from several people that the amount is an important thing to know about. Many times investigators think that they're doing you a favor by having higher amounts of the material that they're providing, but often for the types of procedures that are done by all of us, the smaller amounts are fully adequate, very small amounts of serum and cells and culture. And then when it comes to actually uh, the quantification side of it, to make sure that you know again uh, what the investigator and analytes are that they want to quantify so that you know which are the appropriate internal standards extraction protocols to use for your targeted lipidomic analysis. In our particular case, we would describe that we were going to request the samples to be provided in a specific type of test tube <clears throat> that we did our extractions with, which turned out to be the Pyrex 13 by 100 millimeter borosilicate screw cap test tubes with Teflon caps, which you have to order separately from the regular caps, as you know, that you get with test tubes. Otherwise, you get gl glues and gums and things that go into the uh, extract. Also, you need to pay attention to uh, variation in the tubes from even the same supplier. We had one instance in which uh, all of our extractions suddenly were giving us uh, chemically degraded compounds uh, that we fought for a long time to figure out where we were making mistakes, but it turned out that the vendor had come out with a, uh, it was now getting their uh, glass from a different uh, source and that had introduced contaminants that we had to sort through and finally uh, come back again with the glass that worked for us. And then finding that that worked to buy a large quantity so we could avoid having that happen again. Frozen samples for stingle lipids are often uh, pretty stable. So um, we're in a lot better shape than one is in general for other lipidomics classes. And even lyophilized samples are often uh, easy to uh, keep for reasonable amounts of time. But that all comes with a caveat that it depends on what specific category of molecules you're looking at. Sphingoid bases, for example, are much more labile because of the reactivity of the amino group than something relatively inert like a, a glucosyl ceramide. In moving on to extraction and solubilization, I mentioned the solubilization from the standpoint of when then you redissolve what you've extracted, or also sometimes when you redissolve your standards, because often you'll find it difficult for a molecule like sphingosine 1-phosphate or any sphingoid base 1-phosphate to get the standard to dissolve uh, uniformly. And if you can't dissolve your standards uh, fully, then it's going to obviously uh, distort whatever you'll see anywhere else. And to remind you again that that is partially because ceramides are among the least polar and are the most hydrophobic lipids in membranes. And the one deoxy counterparts that are becoming uh, of interest to more and more people these days are even more hydrophobic as documented in the literature. The sphingosine 1-phosphate that I've indicated is a huge headache. And I want to humorously add this email note that I had from somebody that was recently asking if they had any tips about dissolving sphingosine 1-phosphate for some chemistry that I've been doing with sphingosine phosphate and having difficulty getting it in solution. And they also point out the complaint of how hard it is to work with 
but note as has Avanti lipids and others that you do get some uh, help in dissolving uh, sphingosine phosphate if you use a bit of base to get it to dissolve. And then on the other side of the spectrum, that once you get to the gangliosides and the high order glycolipids, they have a high degree of hydrophilicity intrinsic to the molecules, but also when you realize that there are huge numbers of water molecules associated with the carbohydrates of the uh, glycosphingolipids as noted in this reference, accounts for why it's so difficult to get them into some of the same organic solvents that you're using to extract the other families of sphingolipids. So what one can do is try a variety of different solvent systems. And to be perfectly honest, I've tended to use for uh, finding out exactly what is in a new biological material where I've had difficulty with it by any other means, the old school organic solvents that were developed for looking at sphingolipids on thin layer chromatography, which have been described very well by this uh, methods and zymology report by Gary Benek and Deckard. And as you can see from the thin layer plate that's indicated on the side, but it's also true for extracts that are being done by uh, combinations of standards, you can by this extraction uh, technique get in high yield, everything from free sphingoid bases through uh, complex uh, glycosphingolipids. I should also mention that one shouldn't rule out thin layer chromatography because it's a very handy survey tool for looking at a new biological material, especially for sphingolipids where you can get an idea about what the neutral sugars are using orsinol as a stain, the gangliosides using a resveratrol or sorsinol as a, a, a stain. Uh, and if you wanna even try to extract the molecules um, and a not, having visualized them in a non-destructive method such as primalin, by being able to see what's there, then you know what to look for better by mass spectrometry. And as people who do mass spectrometry all know, uh, but might not be as familiar to others is one of the biggest fears with a technique like mass spectrometry is that there's something that you've missed in the uh, particular method that you choose, chose for ionization or what might be degrading in source or that you didn't extract it fully from the biological material. So I continue to think that for sphingolipids, it's a handy tool. If one decides to extract the sphingolipid from the thin layer plate, however, be forewarned, as is well documented by Kathy Costello, that dry silica is a great catalyst for uh, oxidation, in particular peroxidation of the double bonds in the sphingolipids. So it has to be done very uh, carefully. As you know, there are a spectrum of different types of organic solvents that have mixtures that have been used to extract sphingolipids. And many of them do well, although uh, it's hard to, for any single uh, approach to get everything, which is again, why we've used a more complicated method. But for the major species, a direct comparison cited here of the type of method that we use uh, versus MTBE, which is a popular uh, solvent for other people, is, has been uh, found to be fairly close in what you get. As a rule of thumb, every lab should look at this carefully for themselves. So this is the type of protocol that we use where one uses a single phase method for those lipids that are easily lost, meaning by, by distributing into both the upper and lower phase. If you do a two phase extraction system, and that tends to be things like the sphingoid, highly polar sphingoid bases and the phosphates and sulfatides, high order glycosphingolipids we talked about, or a split system. Often in the case of doing the two phase system, it's to get rid of contaminants and then to use them in a host of uh, types of LC and ionization modes. Usually when uses base hydrolysis uh, as a part of the extraction protocol uh, to help get rid of uh, ionization suppressing other lipids, uh, and which also uh, with isomers can sometimes cause anisobars false identifications, but you do have the compromise that in those doing, you lose any one uh, or acyl sphingolipids, such as the O acyl ceramides or the O acetyl glycosphingolipids. A procedure that we found to be fairly uh, uh, 
revealing in doing extractions is simply every time you have a new biological material, take the solvents or perhaps a, a combination of solvents that you're trying and do multiple extractions so that you try, you try it once, you, try, you take the residue and extract it again, the residue and extract it again, and then do it again and look to see to what extent you're uh, getting rid of everything in those uh, sequential steps. And by doing that with say one solvent in the first two extracts and then switching to a different type for the third, it's pretty likely that you're going to be able to find out uh, everything that's there. And then you can back up and decide what method you choose that is giving you the recovery of the um, everything that you uh, think is in the biological material. Anytime one's talking about these sorts of extractions, remember what Dr. Murphy's uh, put online but, and talked about earlier about uh, risks associated with solvents. And in the case of sphingolipids, most often this affects the free amino forms for contaminants that will uh, react with the amine. Sometimes things will interfere with double bonds, but sphingolipids usually have fewer. So that's where you may need to worry about it. So we've gotten through the extraction and the multiple extraction uh, protocols and talked about uh, by list. And I've given you references to the different types of chromatographies if you want to go into that more. So we'll start thinking more about now the core mass spectrometry part. This is a sort of a flow sheet about what we typically do. And looking at for any uh, category of sphingolipids we're interested in to look at what are the uh, optimized ionization uh, conditions, the voltages on the instrument in all sides, the, uh, the temperature for the electrospray, the voltage for the ionization, which can be very important. For example, the shorter the chain on the ceramide, the more, uh, the lower the voltage you need because otherwise you'll uh, get fragment and source fragmentation of the ceramides. The longer chain, the higher voltages to get them to ionize. So there's a lot of uh, playing around with that that needs to be done. And you, will, when you have samples, then often have to program the protocol so that it will go through a series of steps to be able to analyze the different chain link species with a different um, set of parameters for the cycling through the multiple reaction monitoring. And once you've done that and you uh, have some comfort with the uh, types of fragmentations that you're going to see in your instrument and the, the way that you're uh, beating it around, then you'll be able to figure out things like what are your precursor product pairs for setting up something like an MRM or a, if you're doing a, a data dependent uh, scanning. There's a, a many sources of information about that as well as what you can collect yourself. Also, you should play around with the instrument and see how you can squeeze some additional uh, capabilities out of it. And I'll only mention briefly one that Cameron Sullard found that was quite interesting for uh, sphingomyelins was that when you are using the uh, ABI Q-trap type instrument by uh, using the, uh, 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 th the second quadrupole as no longer a fragmentation quadrupole, but basically just a free pass-through quadrupole so that the ions that are excited in uh, the electrospray in Q1 have a chance to spontaneously start to decompose while they're in the ion trap. You're able to get information about the, ace, the lipid backbone of the sphingomyelins, uh, whereas by standard types of uh, mass spectrometry, it's often more difficult to know for sphingomyelins since they mainly lose the head group, what's going on in the backbone. Once you understand that about the molecules in the instrument, you identify the LC conditions that give the full compounds of interest. I already indicated the types of columns that looked optimal to us. Um, the main one to point out about that, they are the general types that you think about, reverse phase, normal phase, is the importance if you want to go beyond just saying that things are hex errors for finding chromatographic conditions that allow resolution of glucosyl ceramides and galactosyl ceramides. And if you want to really get careful to be able to distinguish between alpha and beta hexacyl ceramides, since Roger uh, Sandhoff has found that in some biological cases, there are very interesting alpha glycosphingolipids formed as well. 
and information for that uh, cited in the references. Once you've uh, comfortable them with how you're going to do the LC, then you have to go back and re-optimize your ionization and fragmentation uh, conditions so that you're sure that you now are getting a linearity with uh, uh, concentration, uh, that, that the, chain, the conditions are optimized for different uh, chain lengths of the molecules of choice uh, that you don't have ionization suppression by co-eluting materials uh, coming in it. Uh, and this is a place where it's often handy to think again about whatever your internal standard set is to make sure that it's uh, giving a readout of what you really need to know. And we all, always use an expanded a series of standards at that point where we have, for example, C12 through C24 chain link species for uh, all of the analytes that we're looking at. Um, Dr. Sullard will be talking more about uh, types of cocktails that are available that look at a, a broader expansion of the things that you have available to uh, uh, analyze. I should also mention it that uh, on this right side here is there are things over time of using an instrument you have to start worrying about things like is the electrospray temperature decreasing as the instrument ages. We've had that happen many times and alter the behavior. So that, that having standards that you follow to make sure that that's not happening, all voltages. And that, as I've said in the red here, watch out for changes after you've had uh, instrument uh, periodic maintenances, because very often after periodic maintenances with the instrument being optimized for a set of standards by the service people that have come in, they no longer behave under the optimal conditions for the sphingolipids. And sometimes you have to do things like give more extensive uh, cleaning of the uh, quadrupoles or something like that to really get it back to performing the way it initially was. When you're comfortable about all that, you build your MRM protocols and you're off and ready to go. Uh, again, in our case, we've done that with a series of uh, internal standards that we sort of called the lipid maps internal standard cocktails, which was a combination of odd chains, sphingolipids, and shorter chains that we, again, by the way, we'd set up the uh, MRM protocols and change the voltages for the things that were longer chain. We were able to know what the relationship was between chain length of the things that we didn't have internal standards for versus the internal standard that we added. And by having separate external standards that had all of those chain links, we were able to uh, confirm that. These are just some examples of it, that you do get pretty uh, lines across multiple orders of magnitude for uh, analyzing the different categories of sphingolipids that way. So with all of that, you're ready to go to uh, run your LCMS protocol with monarch age analyte of interest by multiple reaction monitoring, which involves integration of each MRM pair, comparing it to the internal standards, et cetera. And from that, this is the type of uh, data that we uh, started collecting, uh, where one would be able to see across the spectrum of the ceramides in raw cells or dozens of other biological materials. I guess I should say even more than that uh, over the years that we've applied this technology. Um, the, the, oh, I, I did forget one important step which is another thing that you do with each new biological material is do a scan of what uh, potential species are there by a method such as uh, uh, precursor ion scanning or neutral ion loss so that you do have an inventory list for uh, creation of your MRM. You don't uh, blindly walk into the sample and say, well, this is the only thing that I'm that's going to be there because history's told us that. You do a do early on in your analysis of the new material, a scan to validate for yourself what is going to be what you're going to uh, find, and then make sure as you uh, prepare your MRM or use a protocol you prepared before that it encompasses um, the, the things that you found by that uh, initial methodology. And, and uh, what we also found that was interesting in looking at these sorts of profiles was how for some families of the sphingolipids, there were fairly high proportions of the sphingonine backbone or dihydroceramide species, whether we were looking at ceramide itself 
or the sphingomyelins or the glycosphingolipids. And as I indicated, although in this analysis, we did just the hexacyl ceramides, we split it out in others and to separately uh, glucosyls and galactosyl uh, ceramides. Uh, the surprises that I wanted to end with were, as we've started doing these analyses early on, putting them on the basis of uh, molecules, you know, moles and so forth per uh, micrograms of DNA. Or, uh, but then going from that back into actually thinking about molecules, it was astonishing to me that we're really talking about on a cellular basis that a single cell, single raw cell, for example, has about 700 million molecules of the C16 sphingomyelin, 29 million molecules per single cell of a C16 ceramide, and on down the line through other things that you can do that sort of quantification for. It's a huge number of molecules, but an another way of thinking about it is when people look at a particular lipid, let's say ceramide, and you are doing a signaling experiment where you've added something and you say, does ceramide go up? And you only see a small change of a percentage or maybe even something that's with a standard deviation. But after repeated use, uh, looking at it, you still think, well, there's something going on there, but you're discounting it because it seems like it's such a small percentage but you're still talking about a huge number of molecules if you're only talking about even a percent of 30 million. And since most of the biological phenomena that involve these types of lipid mediators occur in specific locations, it may well be that something that's even undetectable as a change by your methodology might be resulting in a, a very relevant and important change in a specific sublocation inside the cell. So one of the things that sort of reoriented our thinking about this whole system as a result of doing these kinds of analyses was breaking it down and looking at what the numbers really are. Likewise, when we did the uh, studies of the activation of the raw cell with KDO2 lipid A, the huge numbers of sphingolipids that changed, essentially every category of sphingolipid changed and going up by as much as doubling in the course of the cells becoming uh, activated and how well that correlated with gene expression changes. So that was very a nice surprise that one could get such robust change and have it uh, related well to uh, our understanding of how the pathway works. But another treat was the fact that in the course of doing this and finding that dihydroceramides, which had been we'd previously associated with um, autophagy and hence had a hint that if ceramides and dihydroceramides were changing, there might be an interesting uh, physiologic thing happening in the cell or potentially physiologically uh, relevant thing happening in the cell. We indeed were able to discover that the macrophages upon KDO2 lipid A treated were uh, being induced to autophagy and by using inhibitors of sphingolipid biosynthesis to demonstrate that the de novo synthesis of the ceramide, dihydroceramide was uh, critical, uh, essential for that induction of autophagy. So it's always satisfying to invest time looking at molecules and then be paid off by uh, finding that there are at the end of the analyses, biological phenomena that uh, are revealed uh, by that analysis. So I would uh, close by thanks to the people that have contributed to this work over many, many years, especially uh, highlight Cameron Sullards, who you'll be hearing from uh, later on, and he gives a presentation about the Avanti standard set. Walt Shaw, who was very generous in the samples that were provided to us at many step steps of our research as part of lipid maps and outside of lipid maps to develop the methodologies and others here that I don't have time to also acknowledge. So with that, I have to close and uh, thank you for letting me talk about these methods and open for questions.